Well, good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. I wasn't meant to be uh, preaching today, as uh, Julianne mentioned. It was supposed to be Pastor Graham Christian, the president of the um, of Victorian Conference here. Uh, but um, as you heard, he hasn't been well. He um, was rushed to hospital on, on Monday, I believe, and uh, had to have surgery to remove his gallbladder on Tuesday. But he's recovering, and uh, please keep praying uh, for him and his recovery because he's been dealing with it for since before big camp. And um, yeah, and so, but I just really appreciate his leadership and just so grateful for a godly man. Let me share you why. I was at, um, when I came to this conference in Victoria, we had a minister's retreat and it was the last day of the retreat and I was spending time with God in prayer as I was walking and God impressed upon me, ask Graham, the president, to pray with you every week. And I said, ah, Lord, you know, do I have the right to do that? You know, I'm just a lowly pastor, you know. I just moved to this conference, you know, sh should I do that? And he says, go and ask him. And so I, I knew what the Bible said. The Bible says, pray for your leaders. And so I, um, as, they were, as they were packing up, I said, thank you so much for this retreat. And then I said, great, 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 Graham, would you, would you uh, consider um, praying with me every week? And his face just lit up. And he says, yeah, I'd like that. A couple of months later, he tells my wife um, that God impressed him to, to pray every week, that he needs to pray more. And he says, well, who can I pray with? And um, he, he thought of me because he had heard that I've got this passion for prayer. And, um, but he says, well, because I'm the president, I can't ask him because then he'll have to do it because I'm the boss. Well, he didn't say that, but, you know, there's this power difference there. And so, but if he asks me, then I'll know. Friends, God works in amazing ways. To tell both of us at the same time and impress upon us, to convict us, God still speaks today. Are you listening? Are you listening to what he says today? Are you listening? I've got an opportunity to finish my sermon series. It's called, it started off with indistractable. Indistractable means it's impossible. You're unable to be distracted. I'm praying that God would help you to be indistractable. Last week we looked at indivisible, that it's impossible to divide, that you would be impossible to divide as a church, as a people, that you would press together, press together. And today I'm talking about indomitable, that it's impossible to subdue, it's impossible to defeat. Building on one from another. This week I had a fantastic study with, um, with somebody, and uh, excitement is contagious. As I was sharing these beautiful truths with him, he started to get excited. He started to, to share, um, you know, from God's point of view, uh, what it would have been like. And I was getting excited. You know, I've studied these, these lessons over and over, many times over and over. But I just love how God uses different people to bring out something more. And his excitement was just so contagious. I love preaching, friends, but I love, love, love studying the Bible with other people. And just to see their transformation, just to see their growth week after week, I just love it. The problem is that, you know, I've only got so much time. And the other problem is that you're missing out on, on the goodness of, of studying with other people as well. So if you're feeling challenged, yeah, maybe I need to study with somebody else as well. I'm going to be talking about that at the end. But excitement is contagious. And we especially looked at from God's point of view, what does God want? I'm just asking a rhetorical question. What does God want? What does He really want? It's a big question. Because we know what we want, many of us. We know what we want or, or yeah. But what does God want? What does God want? The Bible says in 2 Peter, The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, 
but everyone to come to repentance. What does God want in that verse? He doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants everybody to come to Him, to repent, to turn away from their sins, and to find that salvation, to find that peace. But our world is getting worse and worse and worse. I don't know if you've noticed, from natural disasters to wars going in our world, you know, I have to keep reminding myself, because I'm not living in a war zone, that there are people here that are suffering daily. Every day, they're just a, a matter of survival, both in the Ukraine and Russia. I was just thinking, I just looked at some statistics, that uh, Russian soldiers, 200,000 men and women have died. That's 200,000 uh, fathers, mothers, uh, sons and daughters that are not coming home anymore terrible our world is getting worse and worse and then i just looked at the news and about in western australia how a mother uh, strangled and and stabbed and murdered her three children and then burnt the house how does this happen in this world how does this happen in our world what does god want what does he desire you know aren't we expecting aren't we looking forward to this a thousand years of peace that the bible talks about and many people, many denominations say that before Jesus comes, there'll be a thousand years of peace. As the gospel spreads and grows, the world will get better and better and better. But the Bible teaches something else. It teaches that only after Jesus' second coming can we experience this thousand years of peace. Notice this in Daniel chapter 12. It says, at that time, Michael, this is another, pardon me, this is another word for Jesus. Another name, symbolic, um, prof prophetic name of Jesus, Michael. And the other, other parts of the Bible mentions it as he's the archangel, the leader of the angels, the great prince who protects your people. He will arise and there will be a time of distress, a time of trouble, such as not has happened in the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book will be, what's that word? Delivered. Delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. That time of distress, that time of trouble that the Bible predicts. Many Adventists, we know it well. We've been preaching it for, for over a hundred years. This frightens many of us. And, and we're worried, oh, I, I don't want that. I'm not looking forward to that time of distress. I'm not looking forward to that time of trouble. But we know what this is talking about just before Jesus comes. This is talking about Jesus' second coming. Notice it fits very closely with 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the what? The archangel. And with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. This is this deliverance that it's talking about there. When Michael shall stand up and deliver his people. This is talking about Jesus' second coming. The Bible talks about it as the blessed hope. Something that we can look forward to. Something even in our trials and tribulations and stresses and worries that we can look forward to. Because it will be a literal event. It will be an audible event. Everybody will hear it. Everybody will see it. And it will be glorious. Nobody's going to miss it, friends. And there will be that resurrection where all those who are in Christ Jesus, whether they are sleeping in the dust, whether they are dead in their grave, they will hear that voice. They will hear that trumpet call. They will wake up and arise to newness of life. And they will meet the Lord in the air. And those, we who are still alive and remain, those who are alive and waiting until Jesus' coming, they will be instantly translated and will meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with ever. We will be with the Lord forever. Rising up from our graves. Being instantly translated. I can't wait, friends. I can't wait. What would it be like to see it with your own eyes? 
What will it be like to experience with yourself? Oh, there's a saying that says heaven is cheap enough. No matter what we're going through, this is what we're looking forward to. This is what we're looking forward to. And this is why Jesus and, and so many of the biblical writers promised over and over again about his second coming. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, many mansions, other translations say. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back. I will come again and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Friends, this is, this is the blessed hope. This is what we're looking forward to. This is what we can expect. That we do not need to be troubled. But what happens to the wicked when Jesus comes? Where Christian believers, those who are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, it will be a blessed hope. It will be excitement. But what about the wicked? How will it be for them? not the same is it revelation warns then the kings of the earth the princes the generals the rich the mighty every slave and every free hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains and they called to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand so instead of it, them looking forward to with joyful expectation, they instead look at it with fear. And they say, hide us. Hide us from the face of the lamb. Who's afraid of a lamb? Well, when he is glorified and finally comes with his true authority and power, with all thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of angels surrounding him, nobody but those he loves protects and translates will be able to stand in his presence and so those who are not ready who are not waiting will be destroyed by his brightness of his coming the bible says in ezekiel no in exodus 33 that nobody can see the face of god and live unless he protects them unless he translates them unless he covers them with his righteousness. But it talks about it in, in Revelation chapter 20. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, because it uses in symbolic terms what's happening here, a bigger picture. And I want to go a bit deeper today. I want to go a bit further, because this is sharing about future things that have not yet happened, and that we need to know about, that we need to be ready for, and that we need to look forward to. But notice, Revelation 20, right at the back of your Bible is the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and right near the end there, you've got Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 1. And we're going to be staying in here a while, so don't be shy to turn and, to turn and stay there. So verse 1, it says, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He sealed him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. And after that time, he must be set free for a short time. So this dragon, this Satan, will be bound for a thousand years. And Satan's nature... What is Satan's nature, friends? Say again. A deceiver. What does Jesus call him? A liar and the father of lies. The, the, it's in his very nature to deceive. It's in his very nature to lie. Not that he was created that way. The Bible talks about him that he was originally Lucifer, a perfect angel of light, but he chose to turn away from God. He chose to go his own way. And so his very nature is, is deceiving. 
And so when it says in, in uh, Revelation 20 that he sees the dragon and bound him for a thousand years, um, in verse 3, to keep him from deceiving the nations. The only way to stop Satan from deceiving people is what? Take them away. Take them away. And so when Jesus comes again, all of the righteous, where are they going to be? They're going to be in heaven. They're going to be in their father's house waiting that, that mansions, those rooms where God had prepared for them. And that city that God had prepared for them. They're going to be in heaven together. Both the righteous dead, that they will be resurrected and they'll meet the Lord in the air and the living will be translated. But where are the wicked? Where are they during that thousand years? They're, they're dead, sleeping in the dust until after the thousand years. We'll look at that in a bit. But uh, that's what it's talking about. So what? Satan is here. He's on earth with all his angels. And he's all by himself. Nobody to deceive. Nobody to deceive anymore. And I often think, <laughs> and I was mentioning this in the Bible study, that maybe God is saying, you wanted this earth? Here you go. Here you go. But these people, they're mine. These people, they're mine. You wanted an earth without me? Here you go. It's a desolate world. Formless and void, the Bible says, like it was before God came to the world during this a thousand years. The earth will be empty. No longer, um, no longer with any living beings on it anymore. What does it say about the righteous? Where will they be? Verse 4 says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. We'll talk about that in a bit. This is the first resurrection, talking about the first resurrection of the righteous. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. The second death will have no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with Him for a thousand years. So what will the righteous be doing in heaven? They'll be spending time with Jesus. They'll be spending time with God. They'll be seeing Him face to face. They'll no longer be looking through a, a mirror or a glass dimly. But they'll see God face to face. But the Bible says in Revelation 22, 12, notice how it says, and they were given authority to judge. What's this about? Because in Revelation 22, 12, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Isn't the judgment already done? Isn't there uh, decisions already made? You know, when we're in heaven, when we're reigning with him for a thousand years, you know, why, why, what's this judgment about? Hasn't the decisions, hasn't God already made those choices? Yeah, he has, friends. But we will have questions. And more than that, 1 Corinthians 6.3, it's not a judgment against us, friends. But it says, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? That we will have questions when we're in that heaven. We'll have two major questions. One, we will be very grateful and thankful that we are there. And it's only because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us and in us that we are there. So praise God. But maybe we will see somebody that we didn't expect to see them there. Maybe while we were living on this earth, they were rough, they were mean, they were, they were angry people. And we say, what are they doing here? They don't belong in heaven. When I knew them, they were mean, they were angry. Lord, surely you've made a mistake. And so God will answer those questions. He will open the books. And actually, it'll be us judging God. Did you make the right decision? Did you, did you do the right thing here in allowing this person into heaven? And so we will look at their life. And we'll be maybe like Stephen. And Stephen, before, when he was stoned, 
Paul, the Apostle Paul, was holding all the robes of those Jewish leaders that stoned him. And so, you know, when he's going to see the Apostle Paul in heaven, he's going to say, what's this guy doing here? And God will tell him and show him and see in the books about how, um, how he met Jesus on the road to Damascus and how he was converted. But we're going to have other questions. And God forbid... Maybe we'll say, well, what about my pastor? Why isn't he here? And God will open the book and he will show the decisions, the choices that they made and why God says no. And so we'll look through that book, but we'll need all our questions answered. We'll have a thousand years. Why do we need our questions answered? Why do we... All the lies that Satan has been telling over the, over the millennia about how God is unfair and God is unjust and God is, is cruel and God is mean. We'll have all, God will be an open book and he will show you all history to see the decisions that he made. And you say, God, why didn't you do this? We'll have those answers. Why do we need those answers at that time? What will, what will we still have even when we're in heaven? Even after Jesus' second coming. Does anybody know? Doubt, maybe. There's something bigger than doubt. Some, it's a gift that God gives, has given to every single one of us. And it's the difference between God and Satan. Freedom of choice. Even in heaven, we will still have the freedom of choice. Just like with Satan... And it's, it's hard to even say this out loud, but this is who God is. Satan, God created him perfect, but he chose to turn away from God. He chose because he had free choice. And even after Jesus' second coming, we will still have that free choice. And so God needs to ensure, because the Bible promises in Nahum, I believe, that sin will not arise a second time. God has done everything possible to be an open, transparent book so that all those questions are answered so there will be no more doubt. There will be no more fear about who God is. There will be no deceptions about God's character, about who He is. There will be no lies because it would be just crystal clear. And all of the choices from then on will be not my will, but yours be done. I believe you. I trust you, God. And that everybody, the whole human race from then on and all the angels will no longer be in rebellion against God. But will be on God's side. Because he has shown like an open book every choice, every decision that he has made. And we will choose him. We will choose to love him out of that free choice, that free will. Not because of fear. But because he's proven that he is fair. He is just. He is righteous, just as he always said he was. And then after that, after that a thousand years has ended, God will take everybody in this beautiful golden city, the new Jerusalem that he has prepared, and he will come back to this earth. He'll come back to this earth. And the Bible talks about it in Revelation 21 too. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. I can remember 20, 22 and a more years since I was married, but I still remember Marcel walking down that aisle in that park. She was beautiful. She's still beautiful. <laughs> but she was especially beautiful on our wedding day. And that's it. God looks at his church, his people, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride. These are my people. These are my people coming down out of heaven. And as they come to this earth, Jesus comes a third time. There is the second resurrection because the thousand years has ended. Notice what it says. Uh, verse 7. When the thousand years were over, Satan was released from his prison. Why was he released? Suddenly he's got somebody to deceive again. Somebody's got somebody to speak to again. And he will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. 
In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. And they marched across the breadth of the earth. And they marched, sorry, they marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people. The city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So this is the final judgment, friends. And people ask, well, doesn't God give them a second chance? Yeah. This is the second chance, friends. But you see the results of what it will be. They are deceived again by Satan as he gathers up armies and generals and people who were um, huge generals in this life and says, that's our city. Those golden streets, those golden walls, that's our city. I made that for you. They stole that from us. They stole that from us. And just like the deceptions that he started in heaven continued on this earth will continue again after there. And all those people that have been resurrected to life again, they will follow Satan. They will surround that city and they will try and take it over until God says enough's enough. And he does a strange act with, which is opposite to his nature, which is opposite to who he is. And he sends fire down from heaven to finally put an end to sin, to sinners, to Satan and all his evil angels. And then, straight after, the Bible says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Do you think this is pleasant for God? Not at all, friends. These are the people that he loved. Even Lucifer, who became Satan. These are the beings that he loved. He wants to dwell with his people. And this is why it says he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Because it wouldn't be a pleasant thing, friends. But from then on, the Bible promises that there will be no more death. Why? Because there's no more sin, friends. There's no more mourning or crying or pain. Why? Because there's no more Satan, friends. There's no more sin. For the old order of things has, passed, has been done away with. Has been done away with. We've done it Satan's way. For many millennia. Now we're doing it the way that God intended originally. And he uses that fire which will melt the elements with fervent heat. And he recreates this earth. Perfectly. The way that he originally intended in the Garden of Eden. Perfect, without sin, without pain, without disease, without rape, without violence. Absolute perfection. And this is where I was studying with this guy, and he started to get excited. And I can imagine the father saying, come in, come to this new earth. Let me show you what I've made for you. Let me show you. Breathe in that fresh air. No pollution. Ah, oh, it's so beautiful. Smell, smell this beautiful tree that, that I made just for you. Look at this color. This color you've never seen in before with, with, I don't know whether it's iridescent or whatever it is, but you, you, this world is dull, friends. This world is dim. Yes, it's beautiful, in a, but compared to this new earth, we can't possibly imagine. And I can just imagine God taking, look, all these beautiful trees, all these forests, this beautiful city, all this architecture, this complexity, these systems where I created it all for you. No more sin, no more pain. I created it for you. It's for you that we can dwell together. There'll be no more division there. There'll be no more, no more divide in us. We can walk together. We can talk together. And he was getting so excited. And I, friends, I'll be honest. I don't, I don't think about heaven much. I've got some friends. I've got a blacksmith. And he says, we're going to be doing blacksmithing in heaven. And I say, okay. Okay. <laughs> But that's it. We're going to have that freedom. We're going to have time and we're going to have energy and we're going to have resources where we can use our creative thoughts, our minds, the way that God intended. Instead of going towards sin, 
What could you create? What could you build? What could you paint? What could you fabricate? Whatever. When you have unlimited time, unlimited resources and a perfect body. Whew, friends. That's something to get excited about. Where your knee's not aching anymore and your back's not sore because you're lifting some, some heavy poles or whatever it is. Oh, friends. And I can just imagine God getting excited. And God saying, this is what I wanted all this time. This is what I've had to be patient enduring for, just like you. So that we can enjoy this beautiful world together. Together. Friends, God keeps his promises. You say he's slow. He's waiting. He's patient, the Bible says. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God keeps his promises. Trust him, friends. Trust him. Satan may be lying and saying, he doesn't keep his promises. Look, look at all those apostles and how they died for the faith. But the Bible says, this is the eventual reward. This is what we're looking forward to. And victory is guaranteed because God is unable to be defeated. Impossible. Indo mm. Indomitable. <laughs> because God is impossible to be defeated. Our victory is guaranteed. And we can trust Him. We can believe Him. And there's beautiful promises that are speaking to us today. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of the judgment, friends. You don't have to be worried or fearful. Because the Bible says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Those who have accepted Him as their Lord and Savior. They don't need to be worried. They don't need to be fearful. They're in Christ. They have a relationship with Christ. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life, has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. God's provided that way. He's done 100% everything so that we can be absolutely clear about where we stand with God. And you might be saying, well, I, I had a good relationship with God, but, you know, I still sin. I still struggle. I still wrestle. I'm still, ah, you know, the things that I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, those things I do. What do I do? Look at this beautiful promise. Philippians 1.6. Being, what's that word? Say it together. Confident. Being confident of this. That he who began a good work, has God began a good work in you? Has he revealed himself to you? Has he changed your life? Is he, is he growing you and shaping you every day? Amen. He who has began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, that just as it takes time for that seed to grow and bear much fruit, so with us. It takes time for God to sanctify us, to make us holy, to, to, to grow us. But he says he will bring it to completion. He will grow it. And if he started, he's not going to give up on you. He's not going to say, ah, oh, they're too hard. You know, ah, oh, it's impossible for me. You know, even God, I can't do it. No, friends. He's on your side. He's on your side. And he wants to bring you all the way through, all the way through. But we've got a work to do. We've got a mission. And that's what Jesus gave to us in Matthew 28. And again, a reminder to the, ch to the church of how we need to press together, how that there's strength in togetherness. There's strength when we come together. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the work that God's called us to do. It's a privilege, friends. When people ask me how I've been this week, I say, dangerously fantastic. And I mean it, friends. 
for this week, like, I don't want to boast because some of, some of you are, are not fantastic, you know, you're struggling right now and I understand that, but the reason why is because I believe that I am where God wants me to be. I'm, like I said, I love preaching, but I love, love, love Bible studies and, and seeing that growth and I'm having... I'm doing the most that I've ever done in my ministry of 13 years. And I'm seeing, I don't have time, friends, for, for more, but I'm seeing that, 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 that transformation, that change. And it, I, my words are insufficient here, but, you know, to see God working in somebody's life and you're saying, ah, are they really going to accept it? Are they really going to change? And then you see them grasp hold of it with both hands and they, they get excited about it. And then that starts exciting you and reminding you, yeah, I used to be excited about this as well. And it made me think, I'm only one man, but what if we had an army? And I want to challenge you. Do you know somebody that maybe you've had spiritual conversations with, that maybe you... You want to take them to the next level. Maybe, maybe they've been asking you questions about, you know, what's this thing about God? Or, or what, it, why, what about the Sabbath and all these different things? Well, friends, I don't want to have all the fun. And so I especially um, bought, and, and the conference has hundreds of these. They're called the It Is Written Bible Studies. And if you have somebody that, that you would like to, you know, take this next level with, but you don't know what to do, we can train you. We can talk to you. But I want you to pray about this because the best thing that I've ever done before I became a pastor, before I became an elder, was to talk to one of my friends and say, can we study the Bible together? And I was stammering. I was nervous about it. And he thought about it for a bit. And then he says, yeah, I'd like that. And friends, I grew from a, you know, I knew the Lord for maybe a year, two years or something like that. And I grew from just this elementary understanding of the Bible and it just kept on growing as he asked me questions that I've never considered and I said that's a great question I don't know the answer to that but I'm going to look it up in the Bible and I'm going to get back to you and that's what I did as he asked those questions I started to read my Bible when I didn't understand I went to my pastor and I said pastor how do I answer this question this is a good question he says that is a good question let's look at it together and that's what we did but friends you have that opportunity to do that as well so at the moment, I've got 10 of these. This is just the number one. These are 25 Bible studies, but it takes them through a series of studies, and it builds a house. It builds a foundation where they can build their faith on, and they're not saying just because such and such said it. They say, because the Bible says, I believe, and I, I've seen that transformation. I, the first one is, can God be trusted? And it talks about why we can trust the Bible, especially through the prophecies, and especially Daniel 2. And about how God knew millennia, thousands of years in the future, about our time and how it's happening in our day. So if you have somebody that you're praying for, you're thinking about, come and speak to me, come and speak to Sveta. Because even if we run out of these 10 Bibles, these are not for letterboxing. These are not for, you know, leaving somewhere. These are for talking to a friend and saying, if you'd like to study, have a, have a read of this. Have a read of it. If you want to do it with me together, let's do it together. Pray about what God wants to do. But friends, I've seen people's lives being transformed by these studies. I'm excited because, but I can't, it's too many. Never in my life have I met somebody on Sabbath. That's what happened last week. They texted me the next week and said, Pastor, I want Bible studies. I want to know this too. I, at that church, <laughs> somebody came last week first time they've ever been to our church and they were so greeted so warmly and people spoke to them at their lunch and they just loved it and they said pastor i i, I want to know i want to know what the bible teaches i've never had that friends never had that and i believe that this is the outpouring of god's spirit that we have been praying for for over for years every morning we've been praying god send your holy spirit revive us awaken us <laughs> he's sending people friends do you believe it? Are you seeing it? I'm seeing it, friends. And so the question is, who will you tell? Who are you praying for? As Jesus says, go and make disciples. And the Bible says in a, in a, in a beautiful, um, the Bible says in a beautiful parable, 
about how he wants his house to be full. And I, I just, God just brought it to my head as I was just closing. How he wants his house to be full. What is that parable, friends? Where he says, oh, the, the um, help me out, Sarah. <laughs> the wedding, the wedding, that's it, thank you. And he sends his servants to go out. And they said, ah, oh, those who I've called, they didn't want to. They didn't want to come. They were too busy. They were, they were getting married. They were, um, what's that one? They were looking at a farm. They were looking at some cattle. All these different things. Please excuse me. And then what's he say? Go to the highways and the byways. Compel them to come in. I just want my house to be full. I just want my house to be full. This is the picture of God. It's not our job to judge. It's not our job to... <sighs> It's our job to connect with people and allow God to work in a marvelous way through you, sharing what he's doing in your life, taking it to the next level, friends. I'm excited, but he just wants his house to be full. He just wants to show more and more people on that new earth, I made this for you. I did this for you. Christ shows his wounds. I did this for you so that you could be here. Let's sing our last song. It's a beautiful one. In my father's house. No. <laughs> How deep is the father's love? Sorry. I was getting a bit, uh, a bit confused. How deep the father's love. Let's sing it together. Thank you.